Hey everyone, it's Joshua with the Pueblo City County Health Department. I'm here at the food safety class today. If you couldn't make it, um, go ahead and stream online. We're online right now, we're live. So say hello, say what's up, drop a comment, um, like this, share it with your friends. Um, we have a few people here at the class right now, so it's a great time. We're getting ready to start here in a few minutes. Um, for you, you guys that didn't make it tonight, uh, we have nachos here that are fantastic, made by food inspectors, so you can't get any better than that. Um, if you ever have any questions throughout this, like I said, feel free to drop a comment. Um, after, the, after the class is over with, you can always go to the Dish Pueblo. That's www.dishpueblo.com. You can also give us a phone call, 719-583-4307 with any questions. If you have any questions now, drop them in the comment, um, and then we can answer them throughout the presentation. Afterwards, I'll be available to answer any questions that you have. Um, just say hello, how you guys are doing and everything. We have two great inspectors that are teaching this class today. Um, they're really, really good at being able to educate everyone on food safety and stuff. So uh, we have a lot of people out here. Um, everyone's really excited about this. So um, yeah, any questions that you may have, go ahead and drop them down in the comments. Uh, and then at the end of the show, we're gonna go ahead and ask uh, if there's any dates that are gonna be available best for you. So our next class we're gonna have available is gonna be in March. So March 2018, so if there's a date that works best, the time, if this evening didn't work for you, if more of a daytime works for you, let us know. We'll go ahead and put that into there um, and we can build that for our next class. So any feedback that we can get would be awesome, guys. Um, like I said, we're getting ready to start here at six o'clock. So we got about two minutes and we're gonna go ahead and go live. Uh, we're gonna be going through this class. And like I said, uh, the inspectors do an incredible job of teaching this class. So any questions that you may have, uh, just go ahead and let us know. So. Yeah, you want to check out the nachos, guys? Watch, we're going to come in. We've got plenty of salsa, jalapenos, cheese, chips. Um, like I said, there's still time. Go ahead and come down here. This class is going to be going until about 8 o'clock. Go ahead and come by, grab your plate of nachos, learn a little bit about food safety. I mean, it's awesome. Uh, we're going to be doing some hands-on stuff. We're going to be teaching you. I don't want to give too much away because it's super cool, but um, it's going to be really awesome. Uh, not the whole class is going to be streamed online, uh, live on Facebook today. Uh, we're just going to show you a lot of the presentation part. So you're going to be missing out on the cool stuff if you don't come. Like I said, we're going to be here until about 8 o'clock, so swing by. Uh, we're going to have the doors open. So, um, and again, if you have any questions after this show, give us a call, 719-583-4307, or just drop by the dish, dishpublo.com. Um, there's a lot of resources. You can print out information, blogs, and other things. So, uh, with that being said, we're gonna go ahead and flip it around, and we're gonna get ready to go to this, this class right now. spending your evening with us, um, whether that was voluntary or if you were voluntold by your boss to be here. Um, we <laughs> either way, we appreciate that you're here tonight. Um, so I'm Desiree. I'm Autumn. So first things first, we just want to uh, let you guys know that we are streaming live on Facebook tonight. Um, so if you'd like to log on to our Facebook page and share that with your friends, they can follow along with you in the class. Um, if you have other employees that weren't able to make it tonight, um, so yeah, we would appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. Um, so one of the first things that we want to go through is uh, just basic housekeeping. Um, so if you have a phone call or something like that, we just ask that you step out in the hallway to take that. Um, emergency exits right out this door to your left. Uh, there's a stairway down here. We would go out that way. We just ask that you follow Autumn and I uh, down the stairs and out to safety. Um, bathrooms are down the hall this way um, near the elevators. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so first things first, you probably heard Josh talk about it, but this is our website up here. It's called thedishpueblo.com. So any of the things that we go over today, any handouts um, are available online. So feel free to check out our website. We have updates at least once a month out there. Um, so with the holidays and stuff coming up, we'll put out special blogs for that. So a quick overview of everything that we're going to go over tonight. Um, so the first thing, what makes food unsafe? Uh, the importance of safe food. So your role in food safety, that's why you're sitting here in this room tonight. You hold a lot more power than you probably know. Um, and then how to prevent foodborne illness. 
All right, so first question. Uh, this is just more of a poll. So at some point in my life, I have suffered from foodborne illness. Yes? How many knows? How many of you are unsure? So if you have suffered from, from foodborne illness, um, you'll probably know it. You were probably pretty sick. So what, what causes that? Um, so bacteria and viruses are the most common cause of foodborne illness. The symptoms and severity of foodborne illness vary depending on which type of bacteria or virus you're infected with. Um, and then down here we have a list of the six most common that cause hospitalizations and even deaths here in the United States. So what does that look like? Uh, we all eat three times a day usually, so there's a high risk factor there. So 48 million people in the U.S. become sick every year. That's about one in six people. So if you look around, you know, you can look at your neighbors and at least one of you is probably gonna get sick this year. That's 128,000 hospitalizations and about 3,000 deaths. So this number is a little bit skewed because these are people that report to the hospital that actually get checked for these type of bacteria and viruses. How many times have we been sick at home? Maybe we threw up, you know, but we feel better in 24 hours. You know, we might, we might not report that to the hospital. We might not go to the doctor. So we can estimate that this number is much bigger than what we're showing. So the takeaway message here is that all of these are preventable and that's up to you guys. So on your sheet, the first thing uh, that we're gonna talk about here is the factors that bacteria need to grow. So an acronym that we use is FATCOM, hence this picture here. So the first one is a food source. Every bacteria and virus needs a food source. The second one is acidity level. So if you think about acidic foods, oranges, tomatoes, um, they have a, a lower acidic level. So those that are closer to the 4.2 to 7 are more likely to grow that bacteria. Time, and we'll come back to time many, many times throughout this presentation. You'll hear us talk about it over and over. Um, so the reason being is that the bacteria can reproduce every 20 minutes. And the next slide will show you just a snippet of what that looks like. Um, temperatures, so in between the 41 to the 135 is what we call the danger zone. Bacteria and viruses grow very well in that environment. Um, oxygen, either the presence or absence of oxygen. And then moisture. Um, so if you think about something like a tomato that has a high water content versus something like bread that's very dry, it can sit out on the counter. It doesn't need to be refrigerated. Any questions about that? You guys good? So this is just a short video that shows you how rapidly bacteria reproduces. So you can see why that time is really important. So the next thing that we're gonna talk about are the FDA's five major risk factors. Uh, and the first one that we're gonna go into great detail about is poor personal hygiene. All right, so let's talk about that. So when we go um, to work, we should be wearing a uniform or an apron. So one thing to note is that if you are wearing an apron, that should only be worn in the kitchen. If you have to go outside to take a smoke break, you should leave that in the kitchen, go take your break, and then come back and put it back on. Uh, no common towels for wiping hands, that's a big one. So when we walk in to do an inspection and we see somebody with a towel hanging off of their belt, that's a big no-no, because -no, um, they're a breeding ground for bacteria. Fingernail care. So fingers should be clean, trimmed, um, filed, so ladies, no nail polish or artificial nails when working with exposed foods. So if I'm making meatballs and I have on pretty fake nails, 
I'm gonna to wanna to wear a pair of gloves. That doesn't mean that you can't do your job, it just means that you have to take an extra step to protect the patrons from the nail polish or your nails. Does that make sense? Uh, jewelry, so it shouldn't interfere with proper hand washing or contaminate the food. So dangly bracelets, um, you don't want a ring on every finger. Really what the food code says is a single band is okay. So like a wedding ring. Hair restraints. Um, so any type of restraint that prevents hair from contaminating food or equipment. So for us girls or men, um, if our hair touches our shoulders or is longer than that, it needs to be restrained. So that can be a hat, that can be a hairnet, that can be a hair tie, it just has to be pulled back. Um, eating, drinking, and tobacco use. Um, so this seems like something that you probably wouldn't think about, but it's actually really important. Um, so only in designated areas. So we don't wanna see um, an employee cup near clean dishes or something that could possibly contaminate the food. And then drinks should always have a lid and a straw. And that does actually come from food code. Um, and the reason for that is if you think about how you drink a soda, you unscrew the cap, so you're essentially contaminating your hand and vice versa. All right, so a quiz question. Uh, I want you guys just to shout and answer. We have candy up here, so whoever answers me correctly. Um, so I need to wash my hands, A, upon returning to the kitchen to begin work, after using the restroom, after touching my face, before putting on gloves, or E, all of the above. All of the above. Very good. Go ahead. How would you pick it? So we have a couple of videos for you guys. I just want you to watch them first, and then we're going to go into um, some details so you'll have time to write on your papers. Have you been? 
been doing it wrong your whole life? Tune in next time to find out. See you then. All right, so we have one more for you guys. And then we'll talk about it. So let's say I'm a food handler, and I know that I need to wash my hands. What do I do? First, you want to ensure that you are doing all your hand washing at a designated hand washing sink as specified in the FDA food code. Start off by rinsing your hands on your clean, running, warm water. Next, apply enough soap to properly lather your hands and arms for at least 10 to 15 seconds. As you do this, be sure to pay particular attention to the back of your hands, arms, between your fingers, and under your nails. Rinse your hands well under clean, running warm water. If you can, try to avoid recontaminating your hands by using a paper towel to turn off the water. In touching the sink handle with your bare hands, you might pick up some of those germs you just washed off. Finally, dry your hands using a paper towel or energizer. Nice and simple. But extremely important. Now that you know how and when to properly wash your hands, as well as why it's so important to do so, especially as a school nutrition professional, you can effectively keep our children safe. Join us next time on A Flush Food Safety as we have. All right, do you guys like those videos? Better than me talking? <laughs> All right, so now we'll go into those specifics and just kind of reiterate what the video was talking about. So where to wash, designated hand sinks only. Does anybody know why that's important? Because they're not cross-contaminated, like with meat and products like that. Yes, absolutely. So did everybody hear that? So cross-contamination. And then the other thing is, uh, is that they're equipped for that. That's what they're meant for. So you have your soap, you have your paper towels. If you're rinsing your hand off at the prep sink, you're not going to have your soap and paper towels. So that's the reason for that. Uh, when to wash. Um, so before food prep, of course, when you get to work in, in for the day and you walk in the kitchen, you're going to want to wash your hands first thing. Um, one thing that we want to point out, so after using the restroom and then again when returning to the kitchen. So you're actually going to do a double wash when you go to the bathroom. And then after smoking, eating, drinking, touching your face, hair, coughing, sneezing, uh, before putting on gloves, they emphasize that. And then after handling soiled equipment or, or before handling clean dishes. Um, so if you guys notice in your restaurants, you should have a hand sink in the area um, where your dish machine is. And that's the reason for that. Okay, and then going through hand washing, this is kindergarten stuff, right? Um, so should be done with soap and water vigorously for at least 20 seconds. So if you sing the happy birthday song two times, uh, make sure that we're paying attention, scrubbing in between our fingers. This thumb area right here often gets missed. Um, and we do have a hands-on activity that we can kind of show you guys what that looks like. And then dry with a clean, dry towel to remove additional bacteria. So that last step actually does remove additional bacteria from your hands. That's why it's important. Um, and one thing that we wanna know is hand sanitizer will never take the place of proper hand washing. So it can be used in addition to, once you wash your hands, you can use sanitizer, uh, but it's not something that um, is approved by food code. So oftentimes when we go to temporary events, festivals and that kind of thing, maybe they'll have hand sanitizer. It's not allowed as their only method for hand washing. All right, so what's an example of a ready to eat food? Sushi, cheese, uncooked pasta, part cooked chicken, or both A and B? A and B. So what are those ready to eat foods? So ready to eat food means that it's a food that will not go through an additional washing, cooking, or an additional prep to be served as is. So those are your salads. Maybe it's a sandwich, sushi, cheese, 
um, things that are going to go out to the customer the way that they are. Um, so adequate barriers. We always think of, of gloves, but there's actually additional ones here. So deli tissues. So if you go to Dunkin' Donuts, they use the deli tissues to grab your donuts. Uh, spatulas, tongs, the gloves, and also dispensing equipment, which is something that I didn't even think about. But if you go to McDonald's and get some ketchup, that's a dispensing equipment. So glove use. Uh, so the correct, the correct way, um, you're going to want to use them with the ready-to-eat foods and only for that task. So if I am on the salad bar station and I'm making salads and I have to go grab dishes, dirty dishes off of a, a table, I'm going to take those gloves off and only use those gloves for that task. Um, so once my task is complete, uh, I'm going to throw those gloves away. So incorrect way. So anytime that our gloves get damaged or soiled, um, or we feel like we need to wash them, then it's time to change them. Um, so no washing of gloves and no wearing multiple pairs. So you can't put on three pairs of gloves and shed them as you're doing different tasks. That's not allowed. So this is a video um, of somebody that actually came into the health department to file a complaint. So it's a piece of pizza. So as you can see, when they pull that out, that's not a piece of cheese. That's a, a thumb to a glove. So we actually did go out on this complaint and when we arrived at the restaurant, found the cook in the back with the thumb missing off of the glove. He was still using the same gloves. So just keep that in mind. All right, so now that you guys know what ready to eat foods are, um, we're gonna go through each one of these pictures. So how about A up there, cutting up lettuce? Is that okay to bare hand contact that lettuce? Okay, majority says no, why? Because bacteria. Right, so it can be a ready to eat food. Now, if we're prepping that and we're gonna wash it one more time, then that might be okay. Um, but if that is the, the final step and if we're gonna serve it to people that way, then we do need to put gloves on. How about B, sushi? Is that gonna get cooked? No, probably not. So he should be wearing gloves. How about C? Looks like we have some meatballs down here, raw meat. So that is a raw meat, um, and there, it's going to be cooked, so that actually is okay. <laughs> and then D, washing some, some veggies, fruits, that actually is okay. So if you are handling um, fruits and vegetables as you're washing them, you don't have to have gloves on. All right, so sick employees. This is really important for you guys because you're the ones working in the kitchen. Um, so when to call off of work. If you're experiencing vomiting, diarrhea, fever, jaundice, sore throat, uh, lesions with pus, persistent coughing, sneezing, or runny nose. So in, the, in any of these cases, this is what we would call restriction. So if you're experiencing any of these, Restriction means that you can't handle food. So you can work, um, maybe you're sweeping, cleaning bathrooms, um, but not food handling. Does that make sense? So there is actually a list of illnesses that get reported to us. So if you go into the emergency care and they test you um, and you come up positive for any one of these, it goes into our database and we get an alert. Um, so one of the, the first one is hepatitis A. Um, this one in Colorado is actually on the rise this year. We have had uh, outbreaks here in Pueblo. Um, so it is something that happens. Uh, e. coli is probably one that you're more familiar with. Norovirus, 
Shigellosis, and Salmonella. So if you are sick enough and you are diagnosed with one of these, you would be excluded. And that means that you can't come to work until you're symptom free without the help of medicine for at least 24 hours. Any questions about those? No, nope, everybody's good? All right, so which one of these do you guys think is the leading cause of foodborne illness? Salmonella. Salmonella? E. coli. E. coli. E. coli. Any others? So the answer is norovirus. And we'll go through exactly why. So it's the leading cause. About 20 million people get sick every year from norovirus, um, from either contaminated food or water, um, or contact with sick people. So if any of you have kids at home um, and you know your kid's throwing up or they're having diarrhea, you could get sick from them because you know we're taking care of them. We're probably not washing our hands the way that we should be when we have a crying sick baby at home. Um, so one out of four illnesses are foodborne. So that's why you're sitting in this room today um, because you guys are handling the food. So it's important for you to know what these things are and if you're experiencing them to exclude yourself from the restaurant. So 70% of those reported outbreaks are caused by infected food workers. So those are people going to work while they're sick. And then over half of those are caused by bare hand contact. So some of the symptoms, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain, um, dehydration, headache, fever, and symptoms usually develop 24 to 48 hours after eating an infected food. So that comes out to about one in five food service workers reported working while sick with vomiting or diarrhea. Does anybody know why that is? If you were sick, and you were having nausea, diarrhea, vomiting, why would you go to work? Right. Yep. Yeah, maybe you have a family to support. You can't afford to take that day off of work. Maybe you know that you're gonna be shorthanded, right? And everybody on the team is depending on you. Maybe there's only four people on your team, so one person down, you know, there's a lot of risk there. So. Where do these outbreaks happen? So 64% happen in restaurants. 17% happen in catering or banquet facilities. 4% in a private residence. Healthcare facilities, 1%. Schools and daycares, 1%. And then the others, a 13%. So you can tell, you can, you know the reason why we're talking to you about it is because you're the most likely to get people sick if you're going to work sick. Um, so the crazy thing about norovirus is just how contagious it is. Um, so a very small amount, just about 18 viral particles can make you sick. Um, and I think it says, yep. So that amount that can fit on top of a pinhead can infect more than a thousand people. So it's highly contagious. And it, it doesn't say on this slide, but it actually can live up on surfaces up to 72 hours. So the second one that we're going to talk about is improper holding time and temperature abuse. And I'm going to hand it over to Autumn now. Thanks, Desiree. Yeah. Okay, you guys get enough time to write that one down. Um, improper holding time, temperature abuse, and inadequate cooking. We're going to talk about those kind of interdispersed, um, so that's why we have both of those highlighted there. Okay, so how cold does my food need to be? Any guesses? 41. 41, not just cold to the touch. You ever seen people do that? I've seen that during my inspections, it's not fun. Um, so yeah, 41 degrees, that's our, our cold holding temperature. We don't want it any higher um, than 41 degrees. And so again, we're summing it up here, um, but how, would you, how do we hold our food? We can do that in the refrigerator, we can do it in an ice water bath. So again, your refrigerator breaks, a 
again, that region that you're constantly going to breaks down, what do you guys do? You don't want to waste all that food, but you can, you can still save it at that point. So you can make an ice water bath to um, save that. Or again, we hold cold foods in the freezer. So how about thawing? Where do we do that at? We do it in the refrigerator, ideally. Um, that does take some forethought. So the night before, you need to take that hamburger out and throw it to your um, walk-in so it starts thawing out. Um, if you need it right then and there, you've just run out of an ingredient, you can go ahead and take it out of the wrapper, um, submerge it in cold running water um, until it thaws out. We don't want the package on there. The idea is to um, allow that cold running water to slough off any bacteria, because the outer edge of like, let's say, um, hamburger that's frozen in a giant log, um, so we have the water running on it, it's going to slough off that bacteria, that stuff that's warming up higher than 41 degrees, we want to slough off that bacteria with that water. Um, we can thaw things in the microwave, but you want to make sure that if you are, again, thawing an entire log of um, ground beef, that you're using all of that in its entirety. You don't want to defrost and then refreeze. We don't want to do that. Um, and you can also do it as part of cooking. Throw in a chunk of meat and cook it as is, that works. Um, we do not want to leave things on the counter. I know um, I had family growing up that would do that. They would just toss them on the counter, let it thaw out as long as needed. Not the best way to do it. <laughs> so let's avoid that and put our stuff in the refrigerator to thaw overnight. So here we'll calibrate some thermometers and show you guys how to do that. Today, Manuel and I will be showing you how to properly calibrate your thermometer using the ice water method. Remember that ideally, you should be checking and calibrating your thermometers every day, but definitely at least once a week. That's right. Now, let's get started. To calibrate your thermometer using the ice water method, start off by filling up the container with ice and then adding a bit of water until it's within one inch of the top of the container. Stir it well and let it stand for one minute to ensure that it reaches the right temperature. Next, place the thermometer in the container so that the tip is completely submerged and the water covers the dimple. Let the thermometer sit for at least 30 seconds in the ice water. Make sure that the thermometer stem or probe does not touch the side or the bottom of the container. Next, while the thermometer is still in the ice water, rotate the calibrating feature that is right underneath the dial until it reaches 32 degrees. Many thermometers already come with a rotating feature, but if yours doesn't, simply use a small wrench or a calibrating tool like this one to rotate the hex adjusting nut. Remember that some digital thermometers have a reset button that should be pushed. After you have calibrated your thermometers, it's a good idea to make a note of the date and time you did the recalibration. This way, other workers know that the thermometers are accurate. And you always have a clear record in case there's a question Now that our thermometer has been recalibrated, it's ready for use again. Next time, on a flash of food safety, we will be teaching you how to calibrate a thermometer using the boiling water method. We'll see you then. So we talked about cold holding our food, um, but we need to make sure that our thermometers are working so we go and temp that food that it's showing correctly. So if we walk into our um, walk-in cooler and it's warm, how are we gonna find out if that food is safe? We take our food probe thermometer and we go and temp that food. Okay, so real quick, before we get into other cook temps, what's the proper cook temperature for turkey? Is it 200, 165, 155, until it's no longer pink or until the juices run clear? Any ideas? 165, awesome. 165, awesome, any other ideas? We'll go with the 165 is correct because it's a poultry. Okay, so now we'll talk about cook temperatures. Now that we have our thermometer working, now we can actually accurately temp these foods up here. So we'll start with 145. What kind of foods need to be temped to 145 degrees? So that's our whole muscle intact meats, like our steak, uh, bacon, um, any kind of fish fillet. So this is food that's only been cut one time. So it's ideally the only the surface that's been contaminated by the processing. Um, so again, steak can be cooked just again on the outside and then when you insert your thermometer at least to 145 degrees. Um, 155, we wanna make sure all of our ground meats 
as well as um, eggs are cooked to 155 degrees. And again, this is because when you have ground hamburger, just imagine how much processing that goes into grinding up that meat. Um, so it has more potential to be contaminated throughout the food. So that's why we want to temp it to 155 degrees. And then 165 is our poultry and any sort of stuffed pastas. Um, so again, that's ravioli, maybe chicken that's stuffed with another type of food as well. Um, but definitely any duck, turkey, 165. We never ever want to undercook our poultry. Um, and again, anytime we reheat something for the next day service, we reheat it to 165 degrees. Um, and then cooking to order, again, this may be a customer that asks for a steak that's um, rare or medium well. Um, if they ask for something that's well done, um, we know cook it to 145. If not, again, you can um, cook it the way they like. Just know that they have the potential to become ill by eating raw or undercooked foods. Um, and again, that uh, applies to eggs and burgers and steaks. And then hot holding. So we want our minimum hot holding temperature to be 135 degrees. Again, if you guys want to hot hold at 150, that's awesome, but never go below 135. Um, again, this is done in hot boxes, hot food wells, on the stove top, maybe in the oven, um, or under a heat lamp. Once you cook it, you want to hold it, just put it under that lamp. But Again, some of these units aren't meant to cook your food. You first need to cook it on the stove and then you place it into your hot holding units. Okay, so now, how long could food be in the danger zone? So that's out of temperature. How long do we, are we allowed to leave it in the danger zone? Any ideas? Is it no more than two hours? I'm sorry? No more than two hours. Okay, so that's no more than two hours. Any other thoughts on that? less than four hours. So four hours is our max. Typically, if we come in during the inspection and we ask, um, how long has this food been here? We found it out of temperature. We want to know how long. So if we can save it, we'll go ahead and do our best and get you guys in motion to do that. And if it's been over four hours at that point, um, the food may have grown too much bacteria and it's unsafe to eat at that point. Okay, so again, I walk in, I find something out of temperature. How do we fix that? So if it's less than four hours, we can take that item out of the hot holding unit and reheat it again to 165 degrees, whether that's in the microwave, on the stove top, or in the oven. Um, but remember that reheating time frame has to fit in within that four hour limit. So again, if it's um, that food's been in there, it's 110 <clears throat> degrees, it's been three and a half hours, you have 30 minutes to um, heat that up to 165. Uh, so again, we never want the food to be out of temp for longer than four hours. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then if it's greater than four hours, we'll have to throw it out. We can no longer guarantee its safety. In cold holding, if it's less than four hours, we can go ahead and cool it to 41 degrees. And again, that's with an ice water bath, um, in the freezer, in a walk-in, with an ice wand, um, or any of those other methods, maybe adding ice to the food. Um, again, four hours for that time limit too. So remember, four is kind of our magic number. And again, if it's been greater than four hours, we want to throw that away because we can't guarantee its safety. Okay, so we'll go through some active cooling. So what is active cooling? Active cooling involves using an ice water bath and or chill stick while monitoring temperatures at regular intervals. Today we will teach you how to properly use the chill stick. Great, but why is active cooling important? Active cooling methods cool food quickly to prevent the growth of harmful microbes that cause foodborne illness. Cooling is a critical control point, a point that is essential to eliminating or reducing hazards that may cause foodborne illness. That's right, and critical control points are measured by critical limits. Typically, these are temperatures and times. For example, food must be cooled from 135 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit within two hours and from 135 to 41 degrees Fahrenheit within a total of six hours. Let's get started. First, you want to make sure you wash and sanitize the chill stick. After doing this, allow it to air dry. Since we already sanitized our chill stick, we'll move on to the next step. Fill the chill stick with clean water and place it on a 
tray and they bring there overnight. Next, you want to place the food in the refrigerator, freezer, or ice bath and monitor it until it reaches 135 degrees Fahrenheit. Why do this? If you want to insert your chill stick into very hot food, your plastic paddle will crack. Exactly. Once the food has cooled to 135 degrees Fahrenheit, insert the chill stick and stir the food every 15 to 30 minutes for even cooling. Make sure to only use your chill stick as long as it remains frozen. Once the ice inside the chill stick melts, replace it with another frozen chill stick. It is extremely important that you do not leave a chill stick that has thawed in the food. This could actually slow down the cooling process. Once the food has reached 41 degrees Fahrenheit, remove the chill stick, cover the food, and place it in the refrigerator. After you're done using your chill stick, wash, rinse, sanitize, and store it so that it is ready for another use. That's it. You are now ready to use your chill stick to ensure your food is cooled safely. Thanks. So we actually have a chill stick up here. I was going oh. to use it to cool the cheese, but I didn't actually set it up. So you can't really do much with it when it's not frozen. Um, so we can actually uh, do the ice water method like I had mentioned. So you fill it up with water and then with a lot of ice. And so that'll also um, be adequate to go ahead and cool your items. Um, so I was reading the bottom of that actually, and it said not to insert it into foods that are 195 degrees and higher. So I'm kind of surprised. So that's not too far off from um, 212, which is boiling. So I'm surprised it can actually handle that, but it's best to avoid it so we don't melt our plastic in our food. Okay, so we have some effective ways of cooling. Again, in the top corner is the ice wand um, in what looks like soup. It's also in the three compartment sink, and it looks like there's liquid in there. Again, try to cool out the outside of that. So very large container. So we want to use multiple active methods to cool it down. Um, we have a bin of ice here. We just want to make sure we have water in there to make an ice water bath. Um, again, that ice has a lot of um, air gaps in it, and so it's not contacting every surface of that dish. So by adding that water, it fills in those air gaps, and then it cools, again, every surface of that food. You just want to make sure that ice bath is up to the level of the, the food in that container. Um, here we have some Ziploc bags filled with ice. Again, it's on a flat tray, so that gives it more surface area of that food to cool. Um, and again, the Ziploc bags are okay because it's a food grade um, container, so that's, that's great there. And again, the, the flat sheet there, um, it'll cool it off a lot faster that way. Um, so in the video, I just want to make it clear that from 135 to 70 degrees, we have two hours to hit that limit. And again, two hours is our max. And again, between 70 and 135, a lot of unpleasant bacteria tends to grow very fast. That's its, its optimal zone there. So we wanna make sure we always make that two hour limit. Whoever's in charge of cooling in your facilities, let's say you're not going to make it. Um, again, you can reheat that food to 165 degrees and restart it. But again, within that two hour time limit, and then from 135, I'm sorry, 70 degrees to 41, you have four hours. Okay, so that's a total of six. And we mentioned that in the, the um, video a second ago. Okay, so number four, we're going into contaminated equipment. Okay, so ways that we can prevent our, our equipment from contaminating our food. So again, separating raw animal products with ready to eat foods. So say we have a cutting board that we're cutting chicken, raw chicken. Um, we don't want to use that cutting board without first sanitizing it to cut our lettuce. Um, you guys could use a different process or different order to go ahead and cut your food. So let's say we do our lettuce first, and if we don't have time to sanitize that, we can use that then to um, cut up some raw chicken because that's getting cooked. It's not going to be contaminated, contaminated by a ready to eat food. Um, and again, we want to make sure we're properly sanitizing, do our wash, rinse, sanitize, come between those tasks, and then wash our hands. So again, we, were, um, we saw a picture of someone preparing meatballs. We want to make sure we're properly washing our hands and anything we may have touched while we were prepping those um, meatballs. We want to protect our food and our food prep areas from stuff like chemicals, um, employee drinks, so personal belongings, so cell phones, just try to keep those away from your food prep area. Just have a designated employee table for your drinks, your food. Um, keep those chemicals typically closer to the floor. 
We don't want any bleach or dentist soap um, hanging above any food prep areas. If that were to fall or again just rip onto our food, that would not be pleasant. Um, pest control devices. I don't know if you guys have seen those fly strips. Some people like to hang from the ceiling. Not pleasant if you get it stuck in your hair. Um, it's never happened to me, luckily. But you want to have your fly strips above um, trash cans and not, again, above your cutting board that you're cutting or slicers. Um, so have those in corners away from food. And then our ceilings, walls, and equipment that are in poor repair. I know some people have some older build buildings they're working with. So you want to make sure any leaking roofs um, aren't over again food prep areas. Um, we get that patched up or fixed as soon as possible. Um, walls that have drywall that's crumbling or peeling paint. Again, we want to try to patch those up so our food isn't contaminated with those paint chips. Um, and so that, that's about the gist of contaminated equipment there. And so here we have cross-contamination that can happen within your walk-in. Um, so typically we would like your refrigerator to be stacked in this way with our top shelf with all of our ready to eat foods, anything that's ready to be served as is, or again, has gone through the cooking process, you've cooled it, um, so it's ready just to be reheated. If it's safe to eat the next day, it goes on your top shelf. Um, your second shelf will be your whole muscle intact meats. You know, this is the, the shelf we cook everything to 145. It has less bacteria than the meats that are going below it. Um, so third shelf, ideally keep your ground meats below any of those steaks and fish fillets. Um, we want your eggs to go on this shelf with your ground meats. And on the very bottom shelf will be all the poultry. Again, so chicken is, is called like the dirtiest meat. It's a, it inherently has a lot of bacteria on it, which is why we cook it to 165 degrees. So we want to make sure it never drips or contaminates any other food that won't reach that 165 degree temperature. So again, chicken, turkey, always on the bottom if it's raw. Um, let's see. Okay, so allergens and cross-contamination. Who here has had a customer that says, hey, I can't have tomatoes or peanuts or something random like that. Do you guys have any other ideas of what those allergens might be? Just shout them out. Um, Peanuts, yeah, it's perfect. That's a big one. Any other kind of allergens you guys know of? There's uh, like dairy products. Yeah. Turkey, you can't handle dairy. Perfect, yes. Yeah, gluten intolerances, <laughs> definitely. So we have wheat, soy, eggs, tree nuts, shellfish, peanuts, fish, that's anything with a fin, um, and milk. So those are all the things that we want to make sure if we get a ticket that says, hey, this customer can't have this, and it's something that you guys make a lot of, make sure you wash and sanitize your utensils or get off another one and make their order. Make sure again, you wash your hands, change your gloves. So again, I mean, they don't go through some sort of adverse reaction. You don't want someone to go through anaphylactic shock um, because you cross-contaminated. Um, but typically they'll be really good about telling you, I can't have this. Okay, so we talked about not cross-contaminating. We wanna make sure we're sanitizing our stuff properly. So who here uses chlorine or bleach for their sanitizer? Okay, awesome. So with that, we wanna make sure we make a concentration for a sanitizer bucket that is between 50 and 200 parts per million. Again, that's in this range here, 50 to 200. I typically tell people, they don't usually remember the numbers, 50 to 200. So I tell them just remember the color. Um, I say a lavender or a Rockies um, purple. So again, if you can see any tinge of purple, you know it's a safe sanitizing concentration on that white test strip. And again, it's um, very, very specific to that test strip there. Um, and again, with this bleach, it says just regular here. We don't want any of that splashless or that scented bleach um, or any kind of cleaner for that matter, just because that scent is another chemical that's not approved for food use. Um, so we, we don't want anything special. Um, it can be good old cheap bleach and it'll get the job done. Um, he uses quat or quaternary ammonia as their sanitizer. No one? Okay, well if you guys do, we'll talk about it. So 200 to 400 parts per million. Uh, so that's a safe concentration for quat. And again, that's kind of in this range here, 200 to 400. I typically tell people that you want to see like a dirty orange color. So you want to see orange um, behind that green. So if it's pure forest green, you know it's getting into that that higher, more toxic level, um, that's becoming a disinfectant. And so the whole reason we use these test strips 
is because the stronger it is, the more toxic it is. It leaves a residue on your surfaces and it could make somebody sick. Um, we do have some chemical illnesses and we, it happens very quickly after someone ingests some sort of chemical. We don't want that. Um, and again, claw is typically the orange strip here. And for both of our sanitizers, whether we're wiping down a table or again, dishwashing, which we'll talk about later, you want at least a minute contact time. Um, and allow, you wanna allow that to, chemical to do its job. So just like when we cook, that cooking is killing the bacteria, but that contact time for the chemical sanitizer, um, it gives it time to kill that bacteria. So we wanna make sure we give it time to do its job. Okay, so dishwashing, where are my dishwashers? Awesome, everybody, sometimes everybody takes a turn at their facility. Um, so we wanna make sure we go through three important steps when we wash our dishes. And again, that first one is wash. And again, that's with a good detergent, typically with warm water to break up any grease or scum that's on those dishes or utensils. Um, then I'll move on to the rinse stage in your second basin. That's typically clean, running hot water, or again, you could have um, a, dump, a dump sink, um, where again, it just goes through a quick dunk and it goes onto your sanitizing bin. Um, that third one, and there's three options for sanitizing. So if you guys want to use water that's 170 degrees to go ahead and sanitize that dish, go for it, um, just don't scald yourselves. Um, you can use that, the chlorine or clot to do that as well, but make sure that your dishes have at least um, one minute of contact time, completely submerged in um, that basin. Then you take it out and you air dry it. Again, that air dry um, step is giving that chemical time to do its job, continue to sanitize, and also to dissipate. Um, that's why it's so important to have a sanitizer because a disinfectant won't dissipate when it's dry. It'll leave that toxic residue like a film. Um, so that's why sanitizers are important. You need to use the appropriate test strip. Again, we talked about that. You can use that same chlorine test strip, that same quad test strip to test your sanitizer um, bin. And then you want to temp your water to ensure it's the correct temperature. So again, if it's 50 degrees, it may not help in your um, wash bin, trying to get some of that grease off of there. Oh, and then one important thing is when you're storing your dishes, never nestle them together when they're wet. Again, moisture is something that bacteria needs to grow. So you wanna make sure you completely air dry so that we're not allowing bacteria to grow in there. Who has a, um, let's say a high temp dish machine? Anybody? Oh wow, you guys have it all, that's awesome. Okay, so with our high temps, I know typically they have a little gauge on the outside that says, hey, the water is about 180 degrees, 190. Um, that's important for that final rinse, um, but we don't want to use that outer gauge. Just sometimes they break. Um, that's why we want to have little um, test strips that you can place on a metal dish, throw it through your, your cycle, and they'll tell you. Again, kind of like these, these are thermal labels. They'll tell you, did the dish reach 160 degrees? And that's important because our, our dishes need to hit 160 degrees so that they're properly sanitized. Um, and we want to test that dish machine daily. Um, we never know if it broke in the morning or the afternoon or how many dishes were washed or missed at that point and weren't sanitized properly if we're not testing it every day. And so chemical dish machines are kind of the same. Again, you're using that same pot or chlorine test strip. I've seen people use pH test strips, but that's not the right thing. It's pH is the, the concentration of hydrogen. Chlorine test strips test the concentration of chlorine um, so we want to make sure we're testing with the right stuff. Um, again, test that dish machine daily. Um, see if it's not at the proper concentration. There's some steps that you can go through. Um, I'm not sure if it's the manager that takes over for you guys, but here are some steps you can take if your dish machine isn't working. Um, you can prime the sanitizer. There's typically a little switch. You flip it, it'll start running the sanitizer through. You can see it. Um, if it's not doing that, you might check the, the hose for air bubbles. Um, that's not allowing that sanitizer to go through those hoses. Again, call for maintenance, it doesn't hurt. Um, and don't use it until it's been repaired. I mean, if you guys must, you can do your wash and your rinse there, uh, but you wanna go through um, a sanitizer, your sanitizing stage in your uh, three compartment sink. <coughs> so I bought burritos or tamales from a person off the street. This is going into our next topic. Who has done that? Yes, anybody? How about no? <coughs> okay, play to see. How about I don't want to answer? <coughs> Is that a yes as well? No? Okay, so this is leading 
bar food from unsafe sources. <coughs> I'm sorry, talking so much, I just got my throat all dry. Okay, so food's made in a private residence or um, another restaurant, a mobile food vendor, those places that cannot be sold in another restaurant. Um, one in the private home, it may be made an unsafe um, practices. We want to make sure people are following the food code. And the only way we can do that is if they're in a restaurant where they're inspected and where they're bound by those regulations. <coughs> um, so food made by another restaurant, that comes in, um, we can only have licensed wholesalers selling to another restaurant. They have to have a specific license um, to do that. And again, farmer's markets, typically those are covered by the Cottage Food Act. Um, people can make certain baked goods, stuff that doesn't need refrigeration for safety. Um, they can make those at, at home and then sell them at a farmer's market. But again, those are not licensed facilities. They have disclaimers saying this was made in an unregulated kitchen. That's okay. <coughs> we want to make sure people are getting their meat from a proper source. So this was actually found at the state fairgrounds. It's a possum. It still has a head, its little teeth and its feet. So if it has feet and fur, it is not an approved source. <laughs> so we want to make sure we know where our food is coming from. Okay, so dented cans. This is extremely important because of botulism. Um, so if you get a dented can from your, um, your manufacturer, or your supplier, you want to make sure you check those cans. Like when you're receiving stuff, check it out and make sure that it doesn't have any dents. And these important places, your top seam, bottom seam, and your side seam. Again, you can see how sharp these are. Um, we definitely don't want to use those. At that point, the integrity of the can has been compromised. Um, bacteria may have been gotten in there and it's grown for a while, so you don't know what you're opening. And again, anything without a label, you can't use it. You don't know what's in it, you don't know the ingredients, we want to avoid those. Um, but let's say you received a shipment and you're helping move it and you drop a can and it's dented because you dropped it. What can you do? Go ahead and open it. And you can make it right there. You can throw it in the refrigerator and hold it. That's okay because you know exactly when it was dented um, and you can you know it's safe at that point. Um, but you wanna make sure you avoid those dented cans. And then pest control. This is never a fun one, but it's a source of contamination to our facilities. So you wanna watch for um, pest droppings. Again, any bugs. Um, but you see additional ones, again, different, different seasons, you will see again, beetles and spiders, but again, we want to watch for cockroaches specifically. Um, again, cracks in the floors, walls, and then um, cracks under doors. You can see visible light coming there. You know that's a perfect way for a mouse or a bug to get into your facility, so let someone know. I mean, you guys may not be able to fix it, but tell somebody so they can fix it so you don't have pests coming into your facility. And again, food debris or cooling water. This is so important because we need to clean our floor drains. I know it's not a pleasant job, but if you keep up on it, you won't get a bunch of slime mold, a bunch of food um, getting stuck in there, and that's attracting the pest. Um, cockroaches, for example, I don't know how many can live off one drop of water. So we, we wanna make sure we're mopping our floors, but we don't let it cool there as well. Okay, so the dish, that's our blog. We have a website just for our food safety team. Um, again, here you can find any sort of resource, um, any sort of training that you could possibly want. And we have magnets on this table, so if you guys want to remember this, take a magnet um, from that table and just take a look at it. There's so much you can learn from there. And then our partners in food safety. So I don't know if anyone's a partner in food safety in this room, but you may be able to pitch it to your manager or boss say, hey, um, the Pueblo City County Health Department has this program they're doing, and it's for these facilities that are going above and beyond the regulations. These are people who are documenting their cooling procedures, they're documenting their um, thermometer calibrations. So they're doing a, more work to make sure that their facilities are safe for their customers. So if you're interested in that, or you bosses, let us know, we can get you guys on that track to becoming a partner. Okay. So real quick, we're gonna take a, a turn here. We're done with our PowerPoint presentation. Um, and we're going into our hands-on activities. So for our Facebook Live people, this is where we leave you guys. So thanks for joining us. For our Facebook Live, we're gonna be taking you over to talk to a food inspector. Stand by. Okay, so we have that 
We're taking you into the health department's kitchen. So let's see what it looks like here. Kitchen at the health department. Hey, how's it going guys? We're here at one of our kitchens here at the health department. So we're gonna take this time to be able to answer any questions you may have, kind of do a little bit of a recap of the class. So first off, Des and, uh, Des and Autumn did an incredible job doing that class. So uh, they always do a great job. So if you're ever interested in doing a class or if you have any questions, go to thedishpublic.com. Give us a call, 719-583-4307. Uh, like I said, our next class is gonna be in March. So let us know if there's a day, a time that works best for you guys. Uh, drop that in the comments below or give us a call on that line um, and we can work on that. So yeah, here's just one of our little kitchenette areas that we have at the health department. As you can see, we have our soap, we have our paper towels. One thing we did learn is one of the most effective ways to reduce food, foodborne illness is by washing your hands. Simply using some water, washing our hands, some paper towels, 20 seconds. 20 seconds of scrubbing is very important. So that's a really important thing. What else did we learn, foodies? What else did we learn, guys? We learned that we can do adequate refrigeration, we can do cooling. So for me, I was like, well, you we can always put it in your fridge, right? You can pop open your fridge and you can just put your food in there and you can cool it down because we got that time and temperature. Well, the other thing that you can do is we can use ice. Never would have thought that. We can use ice, we can scoop up some ice, we can put that into our food, uh, we can help bring that down, we can do ice baths. We learned about ice baths today, which is really awesome. We learned about ice wands, so that's a really cool thing that you can use ice wands. Another way, you can make your own ice wands. Um, definitely give us a call, uh, reach out to us, we can give you advice on how to make your own ice bath, uh, your own ice wand, anything like that. What else did we learn, guys? We learned a lot of really cool stuff today. We learned some, uh, our chicken has to be cooked for 165. You know, so 165, it's uh, what Autumn said was, you know, it's one of those dirty poultries, it's those dirty meats, it's our highest cook temperature. Uh, you know, we learned that when we're bringing food down, we have six hours in total, two hours to get it down from 135 to 70. Then we have an additional four hours to get it down to 41 degrees. So 41 is our key number that we want to keep our food cold. So one thing we learned that if it isn't a ready to eat food, which is just something that we're just not gonna take and just go ahead and, and eat, we have to do some cooking to it, some cooling to it. Uh, there's two temperatures. 135 is to hold it, to hold it um, hot or 41 degrees. And this is all in Fahrenheit, guys. And, and those are our two temperatures we're always looking for. So um, a lot of other really cool stuff we learned. We learned about sick illness uh, employee logs, um, logging that because a lot of times we want to make sure that, you know, if someone's feeling sick, that we, we know that. Or if someone gets hurt, that we, uh, we limit them to what they're going to be doing. So understanding a lot of that stuff. And there at the end, we saw a lot of things that could go wrong. Some things that we see, um, dented cans, sometimes unapproved food sources. It's important to understand where you get your food from. And it's also important to know that uh, we're going to be out there checking for that. So if you have any questions on that, like I said, guys, uh, put some comments down there, send some questions over to us, give us a phone call, um, you know, uh, even, you know, you can even uh, message us uh, on Facebook, you know, if you don't want to put one in the comments, you can uh, direct message us, or as the kids say, DM us, and we can answer that for you guys, you know, we have plenty of health inspectors uh, that can help answer any of those questions and stuff, so, um, is there any questions you guys have, you know, just anything that's kind of going on, um, is there something that say um, that comes up to mind. So if not, uh, and even right now, I know it's kind of on the spot and you're just kind of, you know, taking a lot of this in, let us know. And if you're interested in this class, like I said, we're looking at next March to do it. Uh, give us a date or time, give us a call, uh, drop it down below. And if not, hey, you know what? Thanks for joining us today, guys. You know, it was an awesome class. Sorry you guys missed out on nachos, but maybe next time, right? If you show up, we can get some nachos. So. Um, I'm going to tune out. Again, my name is Josh with the Public City County Health Department. I'm one of the inspectors. If you see us out and about, say what's up. And uh, until next time, guys, uh, eat safely.